This scene is not taking place in the Congo. It has nothing to do with Johannesburg or Cape Town. It is not Nyasaland or Nigeria. This is Florida. These are citizens of the United States, 1960. This is a shape up for migrant workers. The hawkers are chanting the going peace rate at the various fields. This is the way the humans who harvest the food for the best fed people in the world get hired. One farmer looked at this and said, we used to own our slaves, now we just rent them. The Secretary of Labor looked at the migrant plight and said, I think they're the great mass of what I've called uh, the excluded Americans. They are people who cry out, the workers and their children and their wives, who cry out for some assistance and uh, whose uh, plight is a shame. It's a shame in America. The president of the American Farm Bureau Federation, the largest farmers organization, says, I think that uh, most uh, social workers would agree that it's better for a man to be employed even if his capacity is such as uh, to limit his uh, income. And uh, we take the position that it's far better to have thousands of these folks who are practically unemployable earning some money, doing some productive work for at least a few days in the year. This is an American story that begins in Florida and ends in New Jersey and New York State with the harvest. It is a 1960 Grapes of Wrath that begins at the Mexican border in California and ends in Oregon and Washington. It is the story of men and women and children who work 136 days of the year and average $900 a year. They travel in buses. They ride trucks. They follow the sun. Well, I don't know. It don't look like we'll ever get ahead. I guess we'll just have to keep going till we can find something better. A minister named Cassidy, who works with them, says, They are just as bad as the slaves. Only on name they are not the slaves, but in the way they are treated, they are worse than the slaves. And somebody has to make a thousand dollars out of his sweat. Is that a slave or not? They are the migrants. Workers in the sweatshops of the soil, the harvest of shame. Now, Edward R. Murrow. This is CBS Reports, Harvest of Shame. It has to do with the men, women, and children who harvest the crops in this country of ours, the best-fed nation on Earth. These are the forgotten people, the underprotected, the undereducated, the underclothed, the underfed. We present this report of Thanksgiving because were it not for the labor of the people you are going to meet, you might not starve, but your table would not be laden with the luxuries that we have all come to regard as essentials. We should like you to meet some of your fellow citizens who harvest the food for the best-fed nation on Earth. David Lowe talks to Mrs. Doby, 34 years old, mother of nine children. Mrs. Doby, what, uh, what, what things do you pick up north? We pick strawberries and cherries. Who works with you out of this family here? Everybody except the baby. Who takes care of them in the field? Well, they just kind of stay along with us or take care of their steps. The one that can't walk usually stays in the baby buggy. What is an average dinner for the family? Well, we just 
You mean, what do we have in... Yeah. We, well, I cook a pot of beans and fry some potatoes or some corn or something like that. How many quarts of milk do you buy for the children? Well, we don't, I don't, we don't have milk except maybe when we draw our paycheck, we have milk about once a week. For all these children, you have The milk? baby has, uh, she is on the bottle, and she uses about 15 cans of milk a week. But the older children have milk about once a week. Do they like to drink milk, Mrs. Dill? Yes, they like milk. The only reason I asked that question, I was quite shocked that they had milk only once a week. She thought they didn't like it, but they, they like milk, but it's, well, there's so many, it, a gallon of milk will make them a glass around, and... So we just can't afford it every day. What do you want most for your children, Mrs. Doby? Well, I'd like for them to have a career, whatever they'd want to be. When they got older, of course, the smaller ones, they have not don't realize yet to know what they'd like to be. But the, old, the older girl, she'd like to go to school if she could, because she'd probably be like the boy, have to quit as soon as she's old enough. She's, she really likes to go to school, but she had to miss last week because she had to keep the baby for me to work. Mrs. Doby, wouldn't you ever care to have a house of your own? I'd like to have a house if we plan to buy one if we could ever get enough to pay down on one, we'd buy one. Do you think this will ever happen? Well, it don't seem like it. This is Belle Glade, Florida, where the exodus has its beginning every year. The migrants call it their home, what the circus people call their winter quarters, their Sarasota. Charles Goodlett, Chief of Police of Belglade, says, The problem that we have now are the ones that, that come here that uh, don't have the money to rent a room. Uh, they, they'll sleep around the bars and the grass and the packing houses, uh, around the lake area, uh, in the parks, any place they can find to, uh, to sleep rest for a few hours. They come here with one thought in mind, is to survive till the end of this season and save enough money to get to, to the next state, going north. From towns like this throughout Florida and throughout the South, the two to three millions move out on their annual migration, which ends in late November. They carry with them whatever little they possess, whatever little they are. At the Okeechobee labor camp, while families were preparing to move north, there was still some work in the bean fields. Children, as usual, were left to fend for themselves. Jerome, uh, how old are you? Nine. Nine, do you go to school? Yeah. Where do you go to school, Jerome? At the Okeechobee Elementary School. I see. What is your sister's name? Lois. That's Lois. And uh, what are your other sisters' names? Catherine and Beulah. Catherine and Beulah. What happened to your foot, Jerome? Drove a nail in out there by the wash house. So you drove a nail in out by the wash house. What did your mother do for that? She put some alcohol on it. Where do you sleep, Jerome? In this bed. You have this big bed? Yeah. What happened? How did you get that hole in that bed there, Jerome? The rat. The what? Rat. Now, Jerome, you are taking care of Kathy, of Beulah, and Lois. Yeah. Now, are you going to give them lunch today? Yeah. What are you going to feed them? Almost. Uh, do you have any food here to give them? Yeah. What time does your mother come home? Yeah. Almost. The following day, Aline King, the mother of Jerome, Kathy, Lois, and Beulah, again was picking beans. Aileen King, I saw your children yesterday at the Okeechobee camp. 
Why didn't you put them in the nursery? Don't make enough to pay for it. How much does it cost to put them in? 85 cents. 85 cents. That's right. Eileen, what time did you come out the field this morning? 6 o'clock. What time would you get home? About 3.30 to 4 o'clock. 6 this morning to 4 o'clock this afternoon. That's right. How much did you earn? A dollar. One dollar? That's right. One dollar. Is that because the beans were of poor quality? That's right. Has this happened before? That's right. Uh, how much will your food cost you today? About two dollars. Aileen, how old are you? Twenty-nine. How many children do you have? Fourteen. How old were you when you first started working in the fields? Eight. You've been working 21 years in the field? That's right. Aileen, do you ever think you'll be able to get out of this kind of work? No, sir. All the migrants travel fourth class. If there is a privileged class, they ride in their own jalopy, in the best Jode family tradition. The long journey begins. Through Atlanta, Nashville, Indianapolis, en route to the fields and orchards of America. Lowe has been following the migrants for the past nine months. Some are free wheelers who travel as a family unit. He met the Parsons family as they were about to leave Belle Glade tomatoes for Indiana strawberries. Mr. Parsons, do you think the farmers you work for care about your problems? No, sir. They're not in particular worried about you. They just want their stuff out and you get away as quick as possible. Would you say that you're welcomed when you're needed? Well, that is the only time that you are welcome is when they are needing you. They're, they're friendly and everything, but once they're done with you, why, well, they'd rather for you to move. Did they ever ask you to leave their places? Oh, yeah. They'd tell you if you finish up like tomorrow, why, well, they had rather for you to be out and gone in about three days, and that way it'll cut down on their electric bills and all the other stuff. What do you want most in this world for you and your family? I'd like for my family to be well, stay together as much as possible, I'd like to be on a farm somewhere out away from so many people to where they could attend one church and be interested mostly in one school. And that way I believe they'd all be better satisfied. Mr. Parsons, do you think this will ever happen? Not to raise it, I'm going now, no. Most of them ride 1,500 to 2,000 miles to work in vehicles owned by crew leaders who recruit the workers for the migration north. This is the Roach family looking for work. Mr. Roach, how did you happen to come to this place? Well, I came to Augusta, and I was talking to some people, and they told me to come on down to Waycross, that there was a more work around Waycross, see? Well, how, how many miles have you been traveling looking for work so far? About 1,600 and something. Mr. Roach, where did you spend the night last night with your family? Over in the woods. Pulled up on the side of the road. I rolled dirt road and slept in the woods, outside the car. May I ask you, sir, what did you have for dinner and your family last night? Well, we had uh, bologna sausage and uh, loaf bread. That isn't very good food for a growing family, is it? Well, we made on it. How much money do you have in the world right at this moment? I only have about a dollar and uh, 45 cents. Well, what do you intend to do about food for your family today? Well, I, I've always worked and I always figured I could, I could get work. I had never um, been where I couldn't get a little something to do. The vegetables the migrants picked yesterday move north swiftly on rails. Produce en route to the tables of America by trailer is refrigerated and carefully packed to prevent bruising. Cattle carried to market by federal regulation must be watered, fed, and rested for five hours every 28 hours. People, men, women, and children, are carried to the fields of the North in journeys as long as four days and three nights. 
They often ride 10 hours without stop for food or facilities. The first stop is normally at Yulee, Florida, one mile from the Georgia border, a checkpoint for farm labor leaving the state. Okay. Okay. There are other stops, Kingsland, Georgia, for bread and sandwich meat. Darien, Georgia, for facility. A roadside stop en route in South Carolina. One thousand miles north of Belglade, Florida, by way of U.S. Route 17 and 301. Through Jacksonville, Savannah, Charleston, Wilmington, and New Bern is Elizabeth City, North Carolina. A bean stop, good for six weeks' work. This camp was home for 40 days for the families of Tom Lockett's crew, now 30 hours out of Belglade. Ms. Blakely, how many years have you been working in agriculture, in the fields? Oh, practically all of my life. I haven't did no other work much but in the field all of my life. I raised all my kids working in the field. I noticed that uh, there's some straw over there. Uh, what is that for? Well, that was the straw they brought for the people to sleep on. Well, uh, weren't mattresses supplied here? They used to be, but they ain't now. Mrs. Blakely, where is the water supply over here? That's it, right, John. For how many people? For this and that old yard, they all use the same. And how many how many bathrooms are there here? Now, where do you where do you use the bathroom? Where is the, where are the facilities? Don't have one. We use our tin tubes. <laughs> Uh, Mrs. Brown, how did the children uh, fare on the journey up north? Well, they got kind of uh, fretful, you know, and rather, you know, got so riding, handling them. But we made it. Miss Brown, may I ask how old you are? I'm 37. Mrs. Brown, how many years have you been working in the fields? All my life. Do you remember how old you were when you started? I was about eight years old. Would you like to get out of this work? I sure would. Do you think you'll ever be able to? I'm hoping so. Do you think you'll be able to, though? I don't know. 20 miles from Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, the workers, driven 900 miles north by crew leader Norman Hall, picked beans at the prevailing rate of 50 cents a hamper. Lunch is not a picnic, whether brought from the labor camp or purchased at the open-air kitchen. Or in a bottle, heated by the rays of the sun. In a survey in 21 states conducted by the National Council of Churches, the migrants themselves listed the evils of labor camp life. Bad housing, flies, mosquitoes, dirty beds and mattresses, unsanitary toilets, and lack of hot water for bathing. One employer of hundreds of migrant laborers was asked, are they happy people? Well, I guess they got a little gypsy in their blood. They just like it. A lot of them wouldn't do anything else. A lot of them don't know any different. That's all they want to do. They love it. They love to go from place to place. They don't have a worry in the world. They're happier than we are. Today, they eat. Tomorrow, they don't worry about. They're the happiest race of people on Earth. Mr. Jones, do you think that uh, the migratory laborer makes a living wage? They make a poor living. In other words, uh, sometimes, it's just like the farmer. Sometimes when things are good, when the yields are good and they can make good money, they make a good living. It, but uh, take year in and year out from different seasons, different sections of the country, I'd say no, they make a poor living.
There are days when beans are not ready for harvest, and that's one more day with no income. Ed King, a crew leader, hauled his workers to this camp at Powell's Landing, Virginia, where they worked five weeks pulling corn and picking beans. And when the fields have been stripped in North Carolina and Virginia, the trucks and buses again move north. This is Little Creek Ferry, outside of Norfolk. 20,000 migrants are ferried to the fertile fields of the Virginia Cape and the eastern shores of Maryland and Delaware for beans, tomatoes, asparagus, and potatoes. For one crew, hardship was climaxed by disaster, the death of a migrant. We had a little trouble on the road about four o'clock this morning, Sunday morning, and uh, a car, a little red, Juan McKeel. Has this uh, ever happened before uh, with any crews coming up north? Uh, once I remember, I was still in Alcala. What happened? Uh, everybody got killed. Every year, as predictable as the seasons, there are accidents resulting in death and serious injury to these laborers. On June 6, 1957, at the intersection of U.S. Route 301 and State Highway 102, nine miles from Fayetteville, North Carolina, 21 migrants were killed, 17 males, three females, and the baby boy. The police report stated one of the causes of the high loss of life was the packaging of the occupants of the truck. Today, only six states have laws providing for the safe transportation of migrants within their borders. The state of North Carolina is not one of the six. Secretary of Labor Mitchell. Hardly a year goes by that we don't read in the paper of some very serious accident where uh, uh, sometimes a dozen or more people have been killed purely because there is no interstate standard with regard to safety. Another complication of the migrant stream is the constant flow of foreign workers into the available pool of domestic workers. Hundreds of thousands of Mexican braceros and thousands of offshore laborers from the Caribbean area, hired by contract, depress the wage scale of the domestic migrant. This controversy is most bitter on the West Coast. Joseph Woods, a Marine combat veteran of the Pacific, competes against the braceros. Low talked to the Woods family under a tree which was their home in California. Mr. Woods, how did you happen to pick this spot to camp? Well, someone told us about it, <laughs> and they said it was all right to camp here. Where do you get your water supply? We go to town after it. And how do you bring it back here? In, in can. We have a 10-gallon can. What do you use for sanitary facilities, Mr. Woods? Well, just get by the best we can. How many days will you have to be picking cherries in order to find enough money to move into a house, Mr. Well, Wood. probably quite a few. It's, they usually want a month's rent in advance, so... By the time the cherries are over here, we'll be moving somewhere else anyway. Mrs. Wood, tell me about the children. Do they go out uh, in the orchards and work with you when you work? Well, we have taken them out uh, sometimes, but they're a little too small to work. Who we, takes care of them here? My father stays here and takes care of them usually. Do you think that you'll ever make enough money picking fruit, Mr. Woods, in order to get settled down in one place and have a home of your own? I don't think so. Throughout the United States, there are others, like the Woods family, who are not able to enjoy the luxury of living in a labor camp. In New Jersey, a few miles from Princeton, is this labor camp. There are two water taps and two outhouses. Families live in one room, usually in one bed. The single men live in the bull pit. Their space, one bunk. Four people live in this room in New Jersey. A family of six will move into this room. Nearby, a trotting raceway has new stables for horses. They cost $500,000.
At Kutchog, New York, 300 migrants live in this camp owned and operated by the Potato Growers Association of Long Island. This is migrant housing, 90 miles from Times Square. Some have tried to leave the endless migratory stream. Wherever this happens, the local slum areas expand. This is Riverhead, Long Island, New York. A minister said, this is as primitive as man can live. This settlement of former migrants is called the Bottoms. In Shenango County, New York State, a farm labor camp The ultimate goal of Ed King's crew, 1,257 miles from Belle Glade. The migrant mission serves one half pint of milk and one cracker to each child. This is their lunch. Their parents eat lunch in the field, sometimes 75 miles away. This is the living space of Eileen King and her five children. The room is similar to their winter quarters in Belglade, only smaller. Charles Schumann, president of the American Farm Bureau Federation, says we're the only group of people that furnish housing for our workers. And we furnish these uh, extra benefits, perquisites, uh, some people, some sections call it the furnish. And uh, it's almost impossible to calculate the value of these added uh, benefits at the same time, we don't condone inadequate housing. Mr. Schumann, why does the American Farm Bureau Federation so violently oppose federal legislation? I think there'll be more rapid progress with state regulation than there will be with federal re regulation. We think that uh, federal legislation will follow the route that almost all federal legislation does of uh, additional and more stringent and more uh, regulations with more and more red tape and uh, more cutting to a certain pattern all over the country. In effect, uh, it would uh, probably uh, rule out the use of migrant labor very quickly. The middleman between the farmer and the migrant is the crew leader, a remnant of the Padron system in wide use 60 years ago. Ed King, a crew leader, says, well, a crew leader, he have to, in a way, he have to be the father and mother and all when he takes this crew out. Because the whole crew most will be dependent direct on him. Reverend Michael Cassidy, who travels with the migrants, says... Well, um, some of the crew leaders, they are good. But the majority of them, they are bad. They are so bad that they are the worst that they can be. They're trying to skin alive these migrants. They take every the diamond, the dime they make. They try every scheme as possible. For instance, they, they pay the, the owner, the grower, pay them 45 cents to pick a crate of tomatoes. And then they turn around, they pay the labor 12 cents at the most. And uh, natural, uh, they have three or 40 or 50 or 100 people picking tomatoes. He makes I know a man last year making here, right in here, fourteen thousand dollars, a crew leader. And all the men they left in here, and I met him in Alabama, they were broke. They didn't have a dime because they didn't make the money then.